This is Twit. I am a person who 100% of the time I put in, hey, GPS, get me here. And I follow it 100% of the time. It may look like it's a weird route. It may say, go this way. I plug my ears when someone is saying, no, 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 we're just going to, no, I don't take your route. I take the route that the GPS is telling me. Is that an example of, of this sort of uh, trusting the machine to understand in spite of, of uh, what, what might be sort of our understanding. I, I don't know if that sort of fits into this everyday chaos theory, um, but I'm curious if you think it does. Well, uh, so it does in that, yes, it is a case of our following the directions of our new robot overlords without <laughs> knowing how, and without, in some cases, not even being able, we will never know how. And routing, I don't think is at that level of complexity. I may be wrong about it, um, but in other fields, um, yeah, we do it. And if we wanted to know why, nobody, literally nobody could explain it to us. Um, it is an example of that. The fact that we do it without knowing that underneath that, that we're all carrying around these, hold up my empty hand here where there should be a, a, a mobile phone, that we are all carrying in our pockets massive amounts of machine learning driven um, uh, apps and, and uh, information, weather reports. Um, but we don't know that it's machine learning based, right? We don't, I think most people don't know or care that the weather reports tend to, weather predictions are now, um, you know, it's, it's AI, it's machine mm -hmm. learning. Mm -hmm. um, means that we are, we've gotten, um, we're, we're getting acculturated to the products and the presence of machines based on chaos, on accepting chaos. So uh, let me, uh, let me say what I mean by that, if, if that's okay. Is that oh, okay. Absolutely, please. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, the old way of predicting weather, which is just as an example, because it's the same thing for predicting um, your annual sales off a spreadsheet. It's exactly the same thing. Was that you would write a program uh, which is based upon what the, you identify what the factors are that affect weather or quarterly sales or whatever the domain is. You identify those factors and you identify their relationship. So for weather, it's that um, cold air, when it meets moist air, is likely to cause precipitation, which is sort of general rule, right? Mm -hmm. um, or in business, it's, you know, it's uh, you subtract expenses in order to get revenues, take the world's simplest example. Um, so you identify the factors and their relationships, and then you, you build a, mo a model out of that a program, and then you run data through it. It works pretty well. I um, mean, we did weather for a long, long time that way. Um, for the past hundred years. But we also know, all of us know, that um, things are generally way less predictable than that. If they weren't, weather reports would be you know, dead on target all the time for the past hundred years. It's hard to figure out what all the factors are because everything on the surface of the earth affects the weather to one degree or another. I mean, literally everything on the surface of the earth does. And that's, that's a lot. And we don't pay attention to that, right? We haven't paid attention to it. We just look at the big masses of air and the big principles. Um, now, with machine learning, it works differently. You don't put in the general rules and principles. Um, you do, in some sense, figure out what the relevant factors are, because that determines what data you put in. But you just take tons and tons and tons of data historical weather data of uh, temperatures and uh, air temperatures and movements and all, everything you can find, or in business, all the sorts of business information and data. You put it in and the system iterates on it and it finds correlations among uh, among these millions of, of little pieces. Mm -hmm. um, and each of these correlations has a probability, has a weight, and you end up with a neural network and the type of, um, I think, most important um, AI at the moment. Um, you end up with a neural network, which is just this connection of all these dots and nodes uh, and all of their weights. If you look at this mass, gigantic mass of points and connections, we can't figure out why they work at that level. And it may be that we can't come up with generalizations about it either that are what we call an explanation. This means that we are able now to deal, we don't have to simplify the data or simplify the, the model the way the pieces, which pieces matter and how they connect. We don't have to simplify that anymore, at least not to any great degree. Oh. We can allow as much complexity as the machines handle. And it turns out, and this I think is a revolutionary change. It turns out that 
you find, at least in many instances, you find more, uh, you can make better predictions um, and do sort of classifications of things uh, more accurately if you don't try to reduce it to the laws and to the factors that you, the human being, thinks think are important. Wow. If you feed in the chaos, you can get some type of order out of it. And it's a less, it's, it's actually reverses the entire history of Western thought. Yeah, that give, that's how you do it. You give into the chaos. It's it's sort of instead of us taking a funnel and sort of pay, putting the weather down into it, and then coming out with these small things that we can then use to calculate. We're sending it up and <laughs> spreading it back out, and then sending it to a machine learning. And I just want to double down on this point so that everybody sort of understands what you're basically saying is day to day we are. In most cases, a lot. I mean, most most people are checking the weather. We are interacting with machine learning day to day, and it is a direct example of how when we give a, give ourselves over to the chaos, it almost makes a, a less chaotic for us day to day. Because I know when I need to take an umbrella to work. Yes, well, let me give you. I, I, I'll give you a quick example, and then I want to connect that to the internet because I think there's a very similar lesson. The internet has set us up for this lesson. So another example is spam filters. Um, for those of us who still use uh, email, which I understand there's a generational divide here. <laughs> What's um, email again? No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a thing you get from your from your father or grandparents. Gotcha. Okay, with mm -hmm. all of the like four yeah. words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, and the and the jokes and the, you know, the bad Animated science. images, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so spam was supposed to kill, it, it sort of at the end of the, uh, beginning of the 2000s, a little before that, spam was a terrible threat to email. It was, it how is email ever going to survive all this spam? And it turned out uh, what I, I will not quite accurately call an early type of machine learning. Um, uh, said, you know, here's what we have been doing, which doesn't work that well which is we try to figure out what words show up in spam and what phrases and uh, and certainly what addresses they come from, and then we filter those out. And you get some measure, measure of relief from that. But suppose we said that's – let's not do it that. Let's not try to figure out everything about a spam that's character. Let's just feed in as much spam as we can, known spam, as well as stuff that we can identify as not spam. And let's let the system try to find not just single words that show up in spam – but also the relationships of words and th their arrangement. And, and it turns out those it, it develops really, really, I'll call them rules. Not, that's fair enough. It develops its own uh, pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. um, and the patterns can be really, really complex, but it works much, much better. And email continues to work, which is why you are still getting these stupid birthday greetings from your parents through email. The way that it, it, one of the ways that the internet set this up um, is that around the same time that spam was supposed to kill the internet, um, the other, uh, excuse me, was supposed to kill email. What was supposed to kill the internet was information overload. Mm. That was the main concern when the internet first went public in the early 90s and, uh, and the web happened and everybody started getting excited about it. Um, the fear was, oh my, uh, information overload. Now, how are we ever going to deal with this information? It's, it's you know, it's, and I don't hear that hardly ever anymore. It seems to have been a problem that we grew out of. And instead, I, there are other sorts of fake news. There's lots of information problems. I mean, there are issues, obviously, with fake news and, and also lots of problems on the Internet. But being overloaded is no longer really a concern, I think, for most of us. We like the fact, we are comfortable with the fact that there is way more there than we will ever get to. Yeah. Because it means we can discover anything that we want. And so we got a culture, and and, and it's a resource. We got used to the idea that we, we flipped the model culturally. There's a thousands of years of thinking the way to do this sort of thing of, what, of when you have too much stuff is you filter it before you start to store it. All right, so uh, because there's... Your, your photo album, your parents were physical photos who were or maybe grandparents at this time who were worrying about what photos to put into their album. Oh, and they'd spend time yes. going through and they'd throw out all the ones they didn't like and they're throwing away information and maybe what were some pretty good shots and stuff that might turn out, might have turned out to be interesting uh, if they kept them. But they made the best judgment, threw them out, put the rest in an album. They filtered on the way in, right? And then they threw out what didn't fit. And we've been doing this forever. We do this every time you build a library or store deciding what to sell because you have to because it's physical stuff. 
On the internet, we pretty quickly figured out as a culture that we don't have to do that anymore. We can put everything in and let people filter on the way out. Let them discover, give them good tools to search and, and filter and people will filter on the way out. And this turns out to be, you're, you're no longer throwing away information. All the stuff is there. And some at some point, somebody's gonna come along and they're gonna want that photo that nobody thought was valuable or that old page of a catalog that now turns out to have this historic interest. So we filter on the way out uh, and we, we no longer have to throw away information. So we, we've gotten so used to overload uh, because in part because we we see the value of it. This is, I think, has trained us for the age of machine learning where the, that overload turns out to hold the key to um, better routing, better weather, to medical advances, to um, uh, you name it. I mean, every day there's, there's something else um, that shows up in the news that AI can do that doesn't seem possible and often we can't understand how it does it.